trying to distract and say, oh, it's the far right that's the problem, and, you know, these are the well, real that's what guys. he is doing. Yeah, exactly. This but, but, moment's a, a joke. But it still focuses the energy of... can get you a cleaner, healthier home. Book at zero...
Hello. I can't hear you, Susan. Can you hear me? Hey, I can hear you. There we go. Okay. Hi, Austin. Hi, Austin. I think he might be trying to merge the two calls. There we go. Now you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes, now I can hear you. Uh, let me see. Got a whole bunch of attendees. Looks like from all over the world. Yeah. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to have you. Uh, we're going to be together for, uh, you know, 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, and you're going to hear from world experts on, uh, on the issues that are important to all of us. Uh, I want to uh, welcome friends and foe alike. Uh, I sent the notice out to the Friday facts list, and we know that uh, uh, our good friends who oppose our efforts uh, are readers of the Friday facts, and I have no doubt that they are watching now. Hello, opponents. Nice to have you. You are welcome in our house. Um, my name is Austin Roos. I'm president of CFAM, uh, the 24-year-old non-governmental organization uh, that works exclusively on life and family matters at the United Nations in Washington, D.C. And, and points around the world. Uh, we were founded in 1997 at the urging of the Holy See that there be an office of full-time uh, laymen working on these issues at UN headquarters in New York. The founders of CFAM, um, and I count them as Teresa Bell of Canada and uh, Tom McFeely of Canada, uh, we were founded by Canadians with Canadian money. Uh, so we have um, Canadian DNA. Um, they went to the Cairo conference in 94, and then they went to the Beijing conference in 95, and then started CFAM in 97. Uh, and we have been at this all along. Um, it's interesting because the debates that we're having today are, gosh, identical to the debates that they had at Cairo in, in 94 and Beijing in 95, because it's all about, uh, it's all about the sexual revolution and imposing the sexual revolution on the rest of the world. Um, specifically, it's, uh, it, it's about abortion and the view that abortion is practically a sacrament to some and that women will never be free until they are free uh, to uh, have the option of killing their unborn children. Um, and so the debate that, that took place at Cairo is exactly the same debate that is going on today at the United Nations. Um, I mean, hats off to the CFAM staff who have the stick to itiveness to stay with this debate year in and year out, season in and season out, uh, even though it's so drearily familiar. There are new permutations here and there, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's quite similar to, to what happened in, uh, in Cairo and Beijing. So what we're gonna do today is we are going to look in detail. Oh, by the way, I want you all to know that the, at, the, at the bottom of your screen, there will be a button that says chat. Um, so under chat, you should issue, or you should type in whatever questions you have for me or, or uh, Susan or Stefano who will be talking. Um, and we will take as many questions as we possibly can. Um, so today we're going to hear about the, the development of the phrase reproductive health. Um, the reproductive health as a term uh, goes back before the Cairo conference and was created primarily, and Susan will talk all about this, as a way to advance a, a right to abortion. And so we're gonna talk about the development of the phrase reproductive health and the role that it has played in the UN debates starting the Cairo conference. And then Stefano Gennarini, who is our uh, uh, legal beagle, uh, came to us fresh out of Notre Dame Law School now several years ago, is, uh, and is uh, the go-to guy for many UN delegations on documents. When documents come out, um, he is asked by delegations to analyze them 
uh, to offer amendments and, uh, and new language and uh, ways to get around the imposition of abortion and much else. And so he, he's really relied upon by UN delegations uh, from uh, all over the world, uh, quite a bit from Africa, uh, who are resisting the colonial impulses of the Europeans and, and the left-wing Americans. Uh, first up, though, is Susan Yoshihara, who's been with us for many years, uh, was a, uh, has a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, um, flew helicopters in the Gulf War, was a White House fellow, uh, taught international relations at the Naval War College and much else, and has contributed greatly to CFAM over the years, and not, not the least of which is in our ongoing understanding of reproductive health and where it came from and where we are now. So Susan, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. And thanks for all of you who are here today. It's a terrific number. Um, thanks to my fellow panelist, Stefano. Um, I have been at CFAM for 14 years, in fact, 14 years and two weeks. Um, I came straight out of the military um, and I was looking for something that challenged me as much and gave me a, a sense of service. Um, and certainly uh, being in the uh, pro-life movement has done that and I'm truly grateful. Um, I came here, I have to say my, my interest in this started much earlier when I was up taking a course at the Harvard Kennedy School from uh, Samantha Power and Sarah Sewell, both uh, very accomplished women in international law. Samantha served as our UN ambassador under President uh, Obama, and they really piqued my interest in human rights and foreign policy. And it was at that time I did some research on my dissertation at the UN, and um, I was talking to various people who were working on international law, and that's when I met the folks, the good folks at CFAM. So I really came with a curiosity on, on how international law affects social policy, and I've been doing that ever since, and it's been a wild ride sometimes. Um, I came in 2006, right as we were uh, being thrust into the last round of negotiations on what is still the latest UN Human Rights Treaty, and that is the Treaty on Disabilities. And it was a baptism of fire for me. Uh, it wasn't all the academic stuff I, I had uh, been doing heretofore. It was in fact a huge debate on this term, reproductive health. There was a movement to put this term into a treaty for the first time. And what I was hearing from my mentors at the time, some of whom were on this phone call, I see you name your names there, was that this is a bad term. We simply can't accept it because it includes abortion. Um, but when I talked to delegates from pro-life countries, I remember walking up to a group of young diplomats from uh, Latin American countries who protected human life in their laws. They laughed. They said, there's nothing wrong with this term. So um, this is how I began my work in this. And, and so it's not surprising that a few years later, I, I will I give you the punchline. Uh, reproductive health was put in that law, and it was done under very surreptitious circumstances, and I've testified at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on this, and I'm on record in this. It was very unusual the way it was put in when 23 countries opposed it, and when 15 countries at the adoption of it said we don't accept it as including abortion. So um, a few years later on, uh, a new nuncio arrived at the Holy See and called in all of us uh, human rights um, pro-life leaders uh, we sat around in chairs without a table on this beautiful marble floor. I remember the air conditioning was very cold that day. And I remember he asked us a simple question. Can we accept this term reproductive health as not including abortion? Or does it include abortion? So I want to ask all of you out there right now, you don't have to raise your hand uh, electronically, but just think about that. Do you think that term includes abortion? Because that was the term, uh, that was the question of the day. And I remember going around the room and everyone said, of course it does, and we can never accept it. Uh, but there was one young lady uh, who had started a, a youth group and they were always looking forward to try to make common cause. She made a very compelling argument that reproductive health could also be used to mean natural family planning and many good things that the pro-life community can embrace and that we should not argue about this term anymore, we should move beyond it. I have to say I left that room wanting really to believe her. And so I just hit the books. I delved into it, researched it uh, for the better part of a year, I have to say, poring over the history of the term, how it's used, and the international law um, support for it, how it's been used. And I have to say, after that time and after getting it cited and published, I came to the exact opposite conclusion of that young lady, even though I wanted to believe her at the time. I came to the opposite conclusion, and that is that this term really has to be contested in international law. And I, and I did use the excellent uh, 
theory of Martha Fenimore and Catherine Sick Inc. on this, the constructivist, uh, constructivist theory on this, if you're an academic. And it was fascinating to me to realize that the best thing we can do is to get this debate in the open, contest the term, and everybody pro and con on abortion needs to talk about it openly. So um, during the Obama years, it's probably not surprising that it, when it seemed like this term was proliferating, we had even more groups come out, one in particular, and say, look, we really should entertain the idea of moving beyond this term again. Uh, in fact, they made fel uh, fellow travelers within, um, within the coalition of nations. So this is a perennial term that is, is often uh, wanting to be adopted and uh, accepted, I guess, as clean and as useful and as um, danger free. Um, I will say that the, the reason why that debate was put to rest is largely because of the Trump administration. When they came in, they got educated and they decided, yes, uh, we agree the best way to attack uh, this problem of abortion being promoted in pro-life countries is to openly oppose this term. Now that's odd, right? For a country that has abortion legalized through all nine months. And yet um, it has been a masterful strategy really because it has, has gone to the very heart of the matter, the pro-life matter. Um, let me explain. The history of this term is pretty clear. Very briefly, it was started by, um, it's essentially a marketing term in the 60s in the United States for abortion groups. If you were in New York City in, this, in the 70s, and I know some of our uh, folks in the Pro-Life Coalition were, you know that the biggest abortion clinic in New York City was the Reproductive and Sexual Health Clinic. Uh, Bernard Nathanson practiced there, conducted many, many abortions there before he converted and then became a pro-lifer. So the term itself, obviously in plain meaning included abortion. When it was adopted into the UN in the early 70s by the International Women's Health Coalition, by Adrian Germain and others, they too uh, included abortion in that term. When it entered into the UN bureaucracy at the WHO, um, the Department of Human Reproduction Research, it too included termination of pregnancy um, as abortion. When it appeared for the very first time in 1992 in a document, it also included abortion. And then finally, when it was negotiated and defined for the very first, and really the time, the only time it's been internationally agreed and adopted in 1994 at Cairo, as I will tell you, it also included abortion. So it's pretty clear that this term was not clean or safe. Um, now the Clinton administration did go in with high hopes of coming out with uh, a right to abortion. And it's also clear that the reason they couldn't is because it was openly opposed by people like John Paul, St. Uh, Pope John Paul II and others who openly brought it to light and debated it just as we're doing today. And that is the reason why then um, Vice President Al Gore had to come out at the eve of this conference and say, a right to abortion is off the table. Uh, so again, open, open debate like this is a very healthy thing. Um, but what, what we did walk away with is a really muddled compromise. And that is this term, even today, does not include a right to abortion. It is never supposed to be used as a method of family planning. And it's something that women need to avoid and be healed from. Now, this is important. It means that we came away with a definition of this term uh, that was bad for women, not healthy for women, and not a, not a good for women. That's, that was kind of the Cairo compromise. But on the other hand, Terms that explicitly do include abortion in that compromise are sexual and reproductive health, reproductive health, reproductive health care, primary health care, reproductive health services, and abortion was declared a part of comprehensive approach to reproductive health. So, <laughs> wow, that was, that was pretty muddied. And so what happened when all of those delegates walked away from the table and then went to Beijing the following year had a similar uh, experience with a lot of confusion, a capacious term, an ambiguous and um, op opaque term. What happened? Well, for the donor countries uh, like ours, the United States, USAID came back to Washington and they renamed their family planning um, department reproductive health. Uh, so did big groups like MacArthur, and Rockefeller and others, they all renamed their population and family planning and even maternal health programs as reproductive health. At the same time, Catholic countries, pro-life countries, countries that protected the unborn in law also went back and renamed their programs reproductive health programs, um, insisting that it of course did not include abortion. So what you have is a stalemate where the donor countries, even today, 
want to have a reproductive health program in your country. And, um, and your country has a reproductive health department and a reproductive health clinic that doesn't include abortion. And you can see how what happens on the ground in UN agencies really matters. Now, um, I have to say that, you know, you notice this week that d the Democrats in Congress um, attacked John Barsa at USAID for his letter saying that the United States can't accept this term. It's a very current debate. And one of the questions they asked was a little bit sleight of hand. They said, well, show me where this term uh, is abortion is a method of family planning. But as I hope I've explained, that's kind of beside the point, right? Uh, it's not just about family planning. It's about the whole constellation of service, services in this term. Um, by openly opposing this term, what we're doing is att essentially attacking the opponent's strategy, if I can use a military term. Because the strategy is to keep it opaque and the strategy is to sort of keep our definitions to ourselves, if you will. But here's what contesting the term does. In the area of norms at the UN, contesting the term keeps uh, abortion be from becoming internalized in policy. Um, in other words, a return to the pre-Cairo understanding. And so if you look at the negotiating strategies of abortion proponents, and I've got some of them if you wanna see them, they absolutely do not wanna talk about Cairo. They want to go beyond Cairo. Okay, that's the area of norms. In the area of programming, contesting it holds back the UN system from going far beyond their mandates in the area of reproductive health and reading into it new things like abortion in countries that protect the unborn. And in the area of rights, uh, contesting the term pushes back at what I have researched as a blatant misinterpretation of the, of the treaties, reading into these treaties a right to abortion and inserting this term reproductive health into these treaties. And I think that that is probably the subject of an entirely different webinar, which we can do sometime in the future. So in the area of norms, programs, and rights, contesting this term is a really healthy thing at the UN. It helps us stay clear of misunderstandings of, of law and really have an open debate about the proper understanding. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that unless and until this term is openly debated in a negotiated document that's binding, and that that document defines abortion out of this term, and unless and until that time, we all need to keep talking about it and nations need to keep contesting it just as the Trump administration is doing. So the question becomes, what now? Um, we need to consolidate gains, we don't wanna lose ground, and we need to move forward. Uh, that means slugging it out in difficult debates, again, <laughs> that we don't really wanna have. It means stiff spines and nerves of steel for our UN diplomats. And that's where our, uh, our advocacy team comes in. And I, I'm gonna turn it over to Stefano. And Stefano, he's not gonna give you an insider look of, of what that negotiating looks like, but he is gonna talk about where we are now, where this debate is today, and where we need to take it in the future. So thanks again for listening. Look forward to your questions and comments, and I'll turn it over to Stefano. Hey, thank you, Susan. Um, and it's, it's great to see so many people on this call. Um, you may recall, you may recall that um, um, last time we spoke, uh, we, we, we brought up how, how many, um, how, how there's, a, there's an ongoing clash right now between um, what U.S. pro-life foreign policy is and uh, what EU pro-abortion foreign policy is in many, many ways. These are the two uh, major blocks uh, that are clashing um, at the United, at the United Nations on uh, pro-life policy. And um, the fact of the matter is that um, many of the countries find themselves caught in between these two um, major geopolitical blocks, the U.S. and the, the European Union. Uh, the European Union is a very large um, source of international aid um, collectively it gives more to the UN system than the United States. And therefore, it, it has a lot of influence and, and a lot of weight what, what, what their policy is. Moreover, for, the, for their inter, entire diplomatic apparatus, uh, promoting abortion, uh, whether explicitly or implicitly through euphemisms like sexual and reproductive health, um, is a priority. And they will go to extraordinary lengths 
um, to advance their priorities. Uh, they, will, they will call capitals, they will call ministers, they will get people fired. And uh, many delegates live in fear of that. And therefore they, they have to kowtow to the European Union. Um, and so what we have been trying to do and what we have seen happening under the Trump administration is that US uh, pro-life policy becomes more and more a priority within the minds, at least of the, um, the political appointees in the State Department, as well as the US diplomatic apparatus more broadly. Uh, what we saw with the John Barsa letter last month uh, the, who is the act, John Barsa is the acting uh, administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, he wrote a scathing letter to the Secretary General uh, say, calling, calling him out for promoting abortion in, uh, during the COVID pandemic. And, um, and what, we are, what we've seen is, is giving the pro-life issue a status and priority that we've never seen under any Republican administration in the past. And this is a huge development. And we hope, um, and we are, I mean, I, I'm convinced we will see this in future Republican administrations also. Um, the simply, simply put, the Republican Party falls apart without the pro-life, uh, without pro-life voters. And therefore we can expect, and we, we must keep, to make, keep making the pro-life issue a priority in US foreign policy at least for Republican administrations, and who knows, for, hopefully for Democratic administrations in the future also. But the, um, what we have to understand where, where the debate is, is um, for many, many years, the US State Department has made promoting sexual and reproductive health a priority. Uh, since at least the Clinton years, um, everybody in the State Department has been trained to promote sexual and reproductive health to promote ambiguity uh, that allows abortion to come into US foreign policy, as well as uh, that allows international institutions to promote abortion. Therefore, it's very hard to change, to right a ship that's been going for such a long time in that direction. And, um, and uh, it's gonna take a lot of work going forward. We've, we've actually seen, we've actually seen uh, you could say almost obstructionism from State Department personnel to, um, to US pro-life foreign policy. We've seen leaks in the press repeatedly. Um, and, um, and we've also seen sabotage in, in many ways, not just obstructionism, but you know, uh, when information isn't, um, isn't brought uh, to the attention of political appointees in a timely way, Many times you can't make a decision uh, uh, that's, uh, that's correct. And we've seen this in recent weeks as well um, with the COVID pandemic. Um, and so what we are seeing here is um, what we've seen mostly from the Trump administration isn't so much the ability to change UN policy. In order for that to happen, the State Department has to be on board wholly, and that's not happened yet. I mean, in order to change UN policy, you have to get the State Department and the embassies of the US across the world to educate capitals, uh, to change their domestic and foreign policies. And that's not gonna happen for, for a while. Um, it's gonna require internal policy changes throughout the State Department. And there isn't even someone in place anywhere in the State Department who's ready to do that yet. Um, but what we have seen is many political appointees being very brave in getting the State Department to deliver excellent statements on the record during official UN meetings, um, as well as to the press, um, including most recently the John Barsa letter. And we need to see a lot more of that um, in order for, for that to seep down into the State Department bureaucracy or as President Trump called it, the deep, deep state. <laughs> uh, because uh, um, in order for US pro-life foreign policy to actually work, it is gonna be essential for the State Department to drive it and to promote it. And we are not seeing that yet. We are not seeing the diplomats uh, capable of, of driving this agenda. And, um, 
and, it, and it's been a particularly frustrating during the COVID pandemic because the COVID pandemic has exacerbated many of the institutional flaws of the United Nations that allow UN bureaucrats to promote abortion with impunity. And um, the, US state, the, the US diplomats have not been as effective as, as they could have. Uh, whereas you have the John Barsa letter, which is a very decisive and strong intervention, uh, basically telling the Secretary General, take abortion out of the UN COVID response or else. Uh, but then you have what the US diplomats have been doing, which is simply to rubber stamp what the UN bureaucracy has been doing. Um, and we've seen this uh, most recently um, with uh, executive board decision of the UNFPA. You may or may not know that the U.S. is still on the board of the UNFPA, even if the UN Population Fund, even if the U.S. does not fund it any longer. And, um, and what this means, uh, but the, U the U.S. really did an attempt even to block uh, the inclusion of a humanitarian right to abortion into the mandate of the agency. Uh, by the time the political appointees were aware of what was going on, it was very late and uh, the diplomats, the US diplomats uh, took advantage and the, all they could get was a minor qualification in a decision of the executive board of the UNFPA, um, which, which was, must be very frustrating for the political appointees in the Trump administration because they've worked really hard to, to oppose uh, uh, abortion policies in the United Nations. And uh, they are seeing their work undermined and sabotaged by uh, US diplomats. Um, on the other hand, um, and we've also seen this now with uh, the COVID response, uh, the UN Secretary General launched an appeal for $7 billion to fund UN agencies to combat the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And this, um, this response included um, sexual and reproductive health as an essential a component of the COVID response. And, in, and not only that, it, it didn't limit itself to just using uh, euphemisms. It actually promotes what's called the minimum initial service package, which is a package of interventions that UN agencies have designated as essential during emergencies, whether it's a war or a natural disaster, or as in this case, the pandemic. And the minimum initial service package includes abortion. And it doesn't just include abortion. It includes abortion to the full extent of the law. That is, that means that, um, that also it undermines the uh, conscious protections for doctors or medical providers, um, health providers who do not want to perform or refer for abortions. The minimum initial service package actually says that doctors who object uh, and, medic and health providers who object uh, to providing abortions must refer uh, women for abortions against their conscience. This is, um, this is what the United Nations is now promoting, uh, which is, of course, goes against U.S. foreign policy, uh, not just the Mexico Sili policy, but it, it, it actually undermines uh, the Helms Amendment. And the Helms Amendment, you may recall, not only bars uh, U.S. funds from funding abortion, um, but it also uh, prohibits uh, funding, um, giving money to anyone who, uh, who will um, 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 not respect the, the, the conscience of, uh, of doctors. Um, so, there, so this is what we have in the UN COVID response. We have the promotion of abortion. And, um, and we had this fantastic letter from, the, from John Barsa, but at the same time, and, and then we had a um, the, uh, um, the U.S. mission to the United Nations block a resolution, a humanitarian response, uh, just a couple of weeks back, uh, because it would include sexual and reproductive health. But then last week, uh, the U.S. Uh, endorsed a statement, what's called a call to action, um, um, uh, uh, which is just a diplomatic statement, but it's a diplomatic statement of 128 countries um, that, in, that basically... Uh, endorses the UN Secretary General's uh, global response to the COVID pandemic. And the United States did make a reservation, uh, but on the other hand, it still supported the 
um, the re global response effort. So here we have this, you know, schizophrenic U.S. foreign policy in some ways. The, the, in, many, in some ways, we see the political appointees who are very pro-life, who are trying to, to give a, make a very strong uh, pro-life statements. And on the other hand, we have the, the deep state, which is in, deeply entangled in the UN system and invested in the success of, of the UN system uh, to the point of um, you know, trying to uh, minimize the importance of uh, the UN's abortion promotion. And so what can we do going forward? Um, I think the, what's, in, what's essential here is to distinguish two things. Um, we have to have short-term goals and long-term goals. The short-term goal, of course, is to address the legality of abortion. What, we have, what, what has to happen is something similar to what Susan was talking about in 2006, where you get a, a, you know, um, you know, somewhere between 15 to 20 to 25 countries make a statement on the record of the General Assembly saying that abortion is not an international right. Uh, that's essential. That has to happen again. It has to happen during this administration. It has to happen at this General Assembly in the fall <laughs> uh, because uh, we don't know if Trump will be reelected. Um, and uh, it, it, it's absolutely essential to, to get a statement on the record by several countries of the General Assembly saying that abortion is not a right and that there is no obligation to fund abortion. The United States has delivered the statement on its own behalf, but it's essential for the United States not to be isolated. Uh, one of the, the, the worst things that can happen for you in international uh, circles or international policy is to be isolated on any issue. And so we really have to see this happen. And for this to happen, the State Department has to be brought in line uh, with uh, what the political appointees have been doing I know, until uh, now. A, a quick question. Um, you, you're focusing a great deal on the United States. Cast your eye around the world. Uh, what, what, how are the delegations to the United Nations doing on this? And how do these issues impact uh, countries around the world? Get, get out of the United States for a couple of minutes. Yes. Um, so how, how does the, how does the, what, what's, what's the, so here's this one of the other point I was talking about is, is, is we're, we're talking about the legality of the issue of abortion. And so pre preventing an international right to abortion, but there's also the UN policy. The UN policy is quite influential. Uh, so for example, the world health organization. Uh, because of the mandates that are created with the term sexual and reproductive health, is now promoting abortion and training doctors to perform abortions across the world. And not only, they are also promoting practices, uh, substandard practices, you might say, that would be considered medical malpractice here in the United States or are affirmatively prohibited by law, like telemedicine abortions. Uh, and they are promoting this internationally. Um, and they are promoting this not just, uh, you know, sort of at, the, at a very high level, they're, they're implementing it through, through programming. Um, so this is what happens when uh, member states allow this ambiguity in UN policy. You allow the term sexual reproductive health. You think that it doesn't, you maybe think that it doesn't include abortion or, the, or that it may not give the UN a mandate to promote abortion. But that is exactly what the UN system turns around and does. And, um, and, and then we're seeing that the, the difficulty in, um, in turning um, the world around is precisely that for so long, um, the, the term sexual reproductive health has been considered you know, almost benign in UN policy uh, with very few exceptions. And, um, and very few countries are willing to oppose this term, even countries that have quite uh, socially conservative laws and, and even have very socially conservative political leaders. But very few countries are willing to, to actually um, oppose this ambiguous terminology. Uh, there's sort of like a, there's like a diplomatic uh, etiquette, if you like, that you, you don't uh, rock the boat, you have to accept the ambiguity. And um, in actual fact, that's what's harming. Uh, that's what's harming the pro-life cause internationally. Um, that's what's making it very hard uh, to fight uh, the establishment of an international right to abortion because these policy streams, 
um, of, around sexual and reproductive health are really what is uh, sustaining the abortion industry around the world. The abortion industry is a heavily subsidized government industry. It would not survive and would not have the political influence it has without government subsidies, in particular the, the subsidies it receives from the European Union and European countries. Um, and uh, that's why it, it, it's so important um, to, to actually break the consensus of the European Union on the question of abortion. Um, that really, to me, seems to be the priority going forward. Many countries around the world, um, Latin America, in, uh, in Africa, in, in Asia, they mostly aligned their foreign policy when it comes to social issues with that of their donor countries. They do not have their own independent voice. That the most what they will do is they will try and add caveats about national policy space and UN policy, but the agenda that is being driven is driven by the donors. Therefore, um, it's so important for the donors to have a good agenda. And that's why I'm so obsessed with the United States, Austin. Know, um, let, let, me, let me jump in and uh, ask Susan a question from uh, Nigeria. And, and that is, what are pro-lifers supposed to do? Um, what language should pro-lifers use instead of reproductive health in their everyday work? So yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Osagwa, for that excellent question uh, from Nigeria, because this really is the crux of the matter. And that is that, um, that the donor countries have reproductive health programs that include abortion and countries like yours in Nigeria have reproductive pro health programs that don't. So who wins that battle? Um, and this, I have to say, is one of the reasons why pro-lifers have even thought of adopting this term because that's where the money is. That's where our own money is at USAID and you wanna be able to get a grant and do good work with that money. So it, it's a, it's, we're keenly aware that this is a very difficult situation for the recipients of these, um, of the donations. And first of all, let me go back and say that the whole strategy here was to get countries like yours to adopt the term as a clean term and then come in and redefine it later. That's the stratagem. And that's why opposing it is so important. So the first thing is, um, I would say insist that, we, we say at the UN, delete, replace, and qualify. The first thing is see if you can um, not use the term reproductive health, but rather let's talk about what we're talking about. Is this children's health? Is it maternal health? Is it prenatal, antenatal care? Is it um, emergency obstetric care? What are we actually talking about? Let's use the actual terms. This umbrella term that's very murky, that's what's so difficult. You might not be able to delete it altogether if you're applying for a grant where you have to write up the, the summary and say that you're in the business of sexual reproductive health when what you're really doing is antenatal care, okay? But be very, very clear. So clarify the delete it if you can, replace it with the actual terms. And then if you can't do that, then you qualify it with what you're actually talking about. Um, be clear with the foreign funders, you know, and obviously educate the foreign funders who might not know how, um, and I know, I understand from your question that you have pro-lifers in your country who want to use this term. So one of the things you can do is invite them to, to read up on this. We can certainly send you material long and short on educating them on using this term. Um, and I would say get it in writing. If you're dealing with a donor, get it in writing, get a name of the person who's you're working with on the other, your partner, whether it's a European or American or Australian or whomever, and get them held personally accountable that the sexual reproductive health program is going to help protect life. It's going to have healthy outcomes for mother and child in whatever that uh, program is. And you then get to start defining that term, right? You're openly defining the term as producing healthy outcomes for mother and child. Um, unless and until we can excise this term uh, from the donors, donor communities, it is going to put uh, recipients in a really tough spot. Uh, and please get in touch personally if you'd like to talk more about it. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, uh, Stefano, uh, just, just a quick, you know, maybe this gets too deep in the weeds. I'll, I'll handle it. 
you know, one of the reasons that they wanted to uh, repetitiously use this phrase reproductive health in non-binding UN documents over all these years is to establish what's known as a customary uh, right to abortion. Um, they know from the very beginning that they could not get an explicit international right to abortion uh, based in human rights law. And so they have used the repetitious use of the phrase reproductive health in non-binding resolutions and then claim that it has established a customary right to abortion, which uh, essentially means that all countries agree to a particular thing because they believe that there is a, a, a legal obligation to do so. Um, this is uh, repeating reproductive health and non-binding resolutions does not create customary international law, but they say that it does. Years ago, uh, the Bush administration withheld funds, I think it was from UNFPA that year, and uh, they were immediately sued by uh, a, a feminist legal group um, uh, and who claimed that uh, there was a customary international right to abortion based on this repetitious use. This is false. Um, and and we, we, we've been dealing with this for years and years and years. I commend to you uh, the San Jose articles uh, which you can find at San, sanjosearticles.com, uh, which will go through um, all the legal claims and the legal reality of, of abortion and reproductive health and international law, uh, a document that was developed and signed by 60 international legal scholars uh, now more than a decade ago. Um, I, at the bottom of your screen, there's a thing that says Q&A. You can, you can ask questions there. I see, I see I did it again, as I did last time. I said people should put their questions in chat. You can ask a private question under Q&A, and I see that there are two here. Um, uh, will you share the write-up or PowerPoint on the development of reproductive health? Susan, can we do that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, so you can come to our website, c-fam, cfam.org, um, and you can look under research. The, the name, or you can just Google, Lost in Translation is the name of the article. Uh, Lost in Translation, it goes through all of the research that basically what I dove into to come to the conclusion that we did. Um, and I'd be happy to share more with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one question is, what about the EU? Um, CFAM works at the UN and in Congress, uh, important places, but what about the EU? Uh, we actually worked in the EU for many years in, in developing a strong pro-life and pro-family coalition there. It's still ongoing. Uh, I'm no longer convinced it's time well spent uh, because the European Parliament does not have, it, I mean, it's, it's impossible to move the European Commission and the European Parliament has no real power. So it's, it's it, I, I think that the time best spent um, in Europe is at the national level um, and then working in concert across borders uh, when, uh, when, when, uh, when, when it's called for. Um, but uh, I mean, God bless the people that are still working at the European Union. I mean, God bless them. It's, it's, it's really, it's really hard work. I mean, it's, it's harder there, I think, than it is at the UN. And by the way, um, for all of those who are anti-UN, um, you should know that we have many friends there. We would not be able to accomplish anything that we do without dozens of UN delegations that think like us and support our work and we support them. Um, and we even have friends within the UN bureaucracy. Not many, but some. Um, so the UN is not exactly what, what everybody thinks. And I would also point out that the UN is uh, more pro-life than many national legislatures. If there was an up or down vote on abortion at the General Assembly right now, it would lose. And this is why they have to use reproductive health as, as a way to sort of sneaky, sneaky way to get in there. Um, let me see. Um, somebody suggesting the replacement of Gutierrez with... Uh, someone like Anna Gret Kramp Karenbauer. I don't know who that is. Does anybody know who that is, Susan? No, sir, I don't. <laughs> Stefano? No, I have not heard of that, but on, on the replacement of the Secretary General, I'm, I'm, pretty f I'm, I'm fairly certain that the next Secretary General is gonna be from Latin America. It's Latin America's turn, according to the rotation. And, um, the, and most the, the leading candidate would be, without a doubt, Michelle Bachelet, who has led UN Women, as well as the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, as well as having been a very popular president in Chile, uh, at least during her first term. Second term was less popular. But um, 
So, and, and she would be terrible. Um, and talk about uh, someone who will really promote abortion through the UN um, if Michelle Bachelet became the next, uh, um, the next uh, Secretary General, we could really see a transformation of the UN bureaucracy. Um, anybody who is pro-life will be kicked out. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Um, Stefano, there or, or Susan, there was a question uh, from the floor on the Helms Amendment. Can you speak a, a little bit about uh, what the Helms Amendment is and does? So the Helms Amendment, uh, there's a great paper by Rebecca Ois on our research uh, section uh, of our website, and I, I'll, I'll link to it in the, in the comment section. Um, the, that explains the Helms Amendment and what it does. Um, what's essential is that the Helms Amendment uh, was passed in 1973, shortly after Roe v. Wade. And uh, what it says is that none of the money uh, appropriated um, in furtherance of the Foreign Assistance Act can be used uh, to uh, perform abortions or to force doctors to perform abortions. Um, and that's, a, that's really great. Uh, the problem is that it's been interpreted very narrowly so that it means that um, even, gr gr even groups that do perform abortion or force doctors to perform abortions can still receive U.S. funds um, as long as they don't, they don't do it with U.S. funds, as long as they don't do abortions with U.S. funds. Um, hence, you, you, there was the need for the Mexico City policy uh, during the Reagan administration, which basically said, we're not even going to give money uh, to groups that perform abortions. Um, uh, whereas the Helms Amendment would allow still groups that uh, perform abortions to receive U.S. funds, they would just have to segregate U.S. funds from, from the other funds. Um, and um, so the Mexico City policy in some ways is more comprehensive. At the same time, the Mexico City policy has a lot of loopholes that we're seeing now also are being exploited by abortion groups. So it's, it's a it's a really um, complicated battle that will go on and will keep going on uh, legally. Um, I think one of the great, greatest, uh, most important things that uh, there were several questions about what can we do? What, can, what should we be doing? I'm seeing those questions. And I, I think the, the most important thing is to educate. Um, it's, it's to educate policymakers, but to educate also the public to create accountability. That's one of the most beautiful things about CFAM. Um, that, that has been so consistent for so many years is that we have been there uh, educating the public and educating um, um, policymakers and holding them accountable, frankly. Um, I think one of the most beautiful things about working for CFIM is that we can set the bar really high. Um, and in some ways, e even the policymakers, um, you know, they, they respect that. Even, even when they feel unable to politically take the positions that we are advocating, we know that they respect CFAM because we are consistent and we have a coherent position over time. And um, I think that's really important. What has to happen is there needs to be a lot more education, a lot more um, uh, accountability created on this issue. I, I, I'll, I'll just pinpoint the European Union as an example because somebody was bringing up the European Union. What can we do to, to change EU policy? What you need to do to change EU policy, as Austin was saying, is is create more awareness nationally, uh, politically, of what the European Union is doing. I, I, I am willing to bet that nobody in Slovenia, where they just elected a very uh, conservative, uh, or in Slovakia, forgive me, where they just elected a conservative government, or in Poland, or in Hungary, where there are conservative governments in power, actually knows that the European Union is promoting abortion and foreign policy. And when, when we have uh, confronted politicians on this topic at the United Nations, whether they were here for a UN conference or something, the answer we get is, oh, but reproductive health doesn't mean abortion. <laughs> because the European bureaucracy is driving abortion internationally through this euphemism. And there's just so very little education. Um, you know, until, until the day that politicians are uh, so long as politicians are able to hide behind the euphemism, sexual and reproductive health, um, we're not going to get anywhere. They, there, there has to be accountability on this issue. Yeah. Um, I, I just noticed that our friend uh, Bill Saunders uh, was, was, is in the group of attendees. Uh, Bill, if you can hear me, I have unmuted you and allowed you to talk. Uh, Bill uh, has worked on these issues for many, many years. 
uh, at the Family Research Council, and now he's at the Catholic University of America, written a number of papers on these issues. Bill, are you there? Yes, I'm there, Austin. Uh, uh, it's a great, uh, great podcast you you guys are doing. You just recently published a paper on these issues, did you not? Uh, <clears throat> I've published several, not just uh, in the last uh, few months, but I will say, I, I mean, I agree, obviously, with what people were saying. It might be interested, interesting for people listening in to, <clears throat> to just know that, you know, once I was on a UN delegation for the U.S. government, and this all this shadow boxing was going on where the pro-abortion people wanted to use reproductive health, and so we all had off record, you know, kind of private discussions with leaders of some of these countries, people, representatives from these countries. And they said, we don't intend for reproductive health to mean abortion. So we said to them, well, we don't intend for it to mean abortion either. So why don't we put a footnote in the document that says every time this word is used, it does not include abortion. And of course, they refuse to do it because as your various uh, speakers have said, that is their agenda, to keep it murky, to use the term, and to try to force uh, recipient countries to legalize abortion by beating them over the head with uh, conditions for aid. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to make a comment on the Helms Amendment that someone brought up. I think that uh, the concern for Helms is really where our pro-life movement it, uh, internationally is going. I think the whole focus is on a crisis and disaster. We have the largest number now of human flow, refugees, war, crisis, disaster, is putting people in absolutely unbearable conditions all over the world. And the UN Security Council, the UN General Assembly, all of our aid agencies are extremely concerned and, and, and justifiably so. And I think the pro-life movement really needs to be equally concerned for these areas. Um, and that's the reason why uh, we need to revisit first principles. You know, when Helms was passed in 1973, the whole purpose of it was simply this, that Americans may have allowed abortion through nine months of pregnancy, but we will not impose this on other parts of the world. We will not impose our beliefs um, that we've abandoned the innocent unborn. Uh, we're not going to impose that in other countries if they want to continue to protect innocent human life in the womb. And I think that um, that has held through Democratic administrations, Republican administrations, and that most Americans absolutely agree that we shouldn't be imposing something like abortion on the rest of the world. Now, why this is so important now is that the people who are suffering, grievously so, in Northeast Syria and in camps all over the world and, and in crises and wars all over the world also are having babies. These are people who still, babies are not being locked down by COVID, they're still coming. And we need good doctors <clears throat> and uh, nurses and midwives who are free to practice the highest standards of healthcare without interference by the UN agencies who are coming in and saying that abortion is part of COVID response. Abortion is not healthcare. Abortion is not an essential component of COVID response. And here's where it gets tricky. For the last 15 years, abortion advocates, and some of you might be here on the call, I would love to hear your comments on this, have argued that the laws of war, the Geneva Conventions, require abortion as a response to bind the wounds on the battlefield, impartially so. They argue that pregnancy from rape is a war wound that can be healed and that it can be healed much the way a gangrenous leg can be amputated, that a pregnancy can be terminated and that heals a woman. Now you might think that sounds absurd, but this argument has made it so far down the pike in policy circles that it's scary. And that's the reason why it was so easy for the Secretary General to come out and say, of course abortion is a humanitarian necessity. Of course it's essential service. So while you're educating yourself on human rights, that's not the problem. I think, we, I think we're well aware of human rights, but now the argument is in humanitarian space. It's called the laws of war or the international humanitarian legal context. It's based on a human rights argument for abortion as a human right, but it is a different body of law, just like international criminal law is a different body of law. But these justices and the elites are using 
and they talk and they work together and they interpret their bodies of law through the other bodies of law. And so please don't forget when you're talking in your countries, don't forget to really look at what your humanitarian agencies are doing. Talk to folks who work at the Red Cross. You know, the International Red Cross has been told that their volunteers have to perform abortion as international humanitarian um, relief and that every country like ours has to pay for it. Now it has many, many legal problems and, and I'd like to invite you, I can, I've written another law review article on this. Um, it's called Abortion and the Laws of War and you can find it on our website. Um, but again, when we talk about Helms, it really gets back to the bedrock principles that Americans do not and Europeans, no one should impose their beliefs um, and their laws on other countries that still wanna promote life and protect it. Um, and so uh, I think that the pro-life movement is moving swiftly. Um, I'm glad that we have, uh, we've got fellow travelers on the call and I hope that those great legal minds will do another thing for us. Go out and recruit young people to be a part of this movement. You know, we need bright young minds, young lawyers, young doctors, young volunteers in whatever walk of life get them educated, and, um, and it's an exciting time to join this movement. It really is an exciting time to join the movement. So please, uh, when you leave this call, after you educate yourself, go out and find young, bright people who are, have serious minds and uh, stiff spines and who want to be a part of it. Uh, let, let me just uh, say uh, that we have a comment in, in the chat box that Anna Gret is the uh, German defense minister She's the conservative chairman of the German Christian Democratic Party. And this was the person that someone was promoting as secretary general. I'm also pleased to see that a friend of ours from the Russian Federation, a uh, longtime uh, diplomat from the Russian delegation uh, is, is on the call. And he has a question, which very well could be our last one. And that is, do we plan to get involved in the activities of the uh, OSCE? And he says, where civil society organizations are very vocal and that their battles can be fought there as well. Do we follow the OSCE gang? Very little. We, have, we, we haven't been able to go to attend um, the OSCE. Uh, we know that there are other uh, groups um, and some, some of the people who are involved in the OSCE are, are here on this call, um, but we know there are other groups in Europe who are involved in the OSCE, um, but we at CFAM have not, um, have not part uh, participated. Where, where is the OSCE located? Stefano, where do they meet? Um, is it Vienna? I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you right away. <laughs> Let me double check. Anybody know? Vienna, somebody. Yes. Paul McNally put in Vienna, thank you. Oh, and, and Gregory did too, thanks Gregory. That's right, Vienna. Um, well, I mean, that's certainly more inviting to go to than Brussels. Uh, I mean, <laughs> nothing against Brussels, but uh, Vienna is one of my favorite cities. So maybe I'll be going to the OSCE one of these days. But thank you for the comment. Uh, we're coming up on, on an hour, um, I, I, so I think we'll wrap this up. Uh, we uh, were maxed out in the room, um, and so while we were sitting here, I upgraded our plan, so next time we can have a thousand people in the room. Um, and uh, so I just want to thank Stefano and, and Susan uh, for coming on and talking about these issues. These are two global experts on these issues. Both have been at it for a very, very long time. Uh, both have been uh, essential components in stopping an international right to abortion. So I'm, I'm so pleased to, to be able to show them, uh, that is to say, show you their faces um, because they often work in anonymity uh, at the UN and our office in Washington, DC. Thanks also to Bill Saunders for coming on for just a second and to all of you for joining us. The next one will be next month. It will be in four weeks. Uh, so put it in your calendar. Uh, that will make it uh, July 15th. Yes, July 15th. And we're going to be talking about a very controversial subject. Then we're going to be talking about the status of sexual orientation and gender identity in UN documents and in international law. And this will get us all into trouble. Uh, so, uh, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Susan, Stefano, Bill Saunders, and everyone who joined in. We will see you next month. If you have any questions, get in direct touch with us. If you want our help, that's what we're for. Uh, thanks everyone. And we are recording this and we will be putting this up on our website. So uh, I bid thee farewell and thank you. <laughs>